If you're in the market for a new car, you've probably never thought about it like this, but there is one defining characteristic of car makers which you must strive above all else to avoid if you'd like to be satisfied long term with your next new car. So in this report, I am going to fillet the entire car market and identify all of the bad players. We're going to throw them under the bus. The better for you to proceed with some semblance of a smile on your face into the future. I'm John Hogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. Even the crap ones do. Like, you email me and say I want a crap one, happy to help. Australia only. Website. Card. Now... The problem with the car market here and around the world generally, but specifically here in Australia, is that it's just too diverse. And I know we all need to be champions of diversity, but there's 50-something brands of vehicle available notionally for you to buy today in Australia. And yet most people, even the ones in the market with the cash in their pocket, ready to burn it on that counter with a gun at their head, they would kind of struggle to jot down... I don't know, a dozen. Certainly 20 would be a challenge. So in this report, I'm going to fill at the market. We really are going to slash here. And basically all the bad ones going under the bus and all the viable propositions will be the last men standing. And this is a really good place for you to be in if you've got that 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 grand ready to go now. And you haven't thought about the car market for a substantial time. This report is sponsored by NordVPN. Now, I'm not a hardcore IT guy, but I've heard enough, especially recently, about data breaches, scams and hacks to know that being online can be inherently risky and costly. You don't have to be tech savvy to use NordVPN. It's a simple one-stop cybersecurity solution. One click and you are protected from hackers, malware and pop-ups across as many as six devices. NordVPN is the world's fastest VPN. I don't even notice it running in the background, frankly. And it only costs about as much as a cup of coffee to keep your data, your identity and your devices secure every month. NordVPN can also save you money because you can assign your virtual location to another country where, for example, flights and accommodation might be cheaper than they are back at home. The same goes for streaming services and you can access live sporting events and other content that may not be available where you actually live. It's a pretty small price to pay for cyber security. Not to mention the potential savings also on the table. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC to get a huge discount off your plan plus four months free. Totally risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash AEJC. Link in the description. And thanks to Nord for sponsoring this episode. According to official data from... T-Dub and the Spice Girls, which comes out every month. I just looked it up this morning. There's 52 or 53 different brands of vehicle available to you today for your consideration. And it depends how you define them, right? But you can throw at least a quarter of available brands under the bus if you are a mainstream consumer and you just identify the irrelevant ones. There's two categories of irrelevance. Obviously, there's irrelevant aspirational vehicles for the uber-rich, like Ferraris and Bentleys and Lamborghinis and Aston Martins and Maseratis and things of that nature. Ordinary mortals, however aspiring they are, they just can't afford it, right? We just can't afford cars of this nature. And once you've driven a few of them, it's like, is that all, you know? I, I expected more. It's like sex with a supermodel syndrome, in a sense, metaphorically. I'm willing to run that experiment too, but I just haven't had the chance yet in my life, not anticipating it any time soon either. I mean, look at me. Anywho, there's another category of irrelevant vehicle, isn't there? And they're the ones that are almost but not quite non-existent. And I'm talking about brands like Alpine, which managed to sell a grand total of... 
four vehicles in 2022, which was incidentally twice as good as Caterham on Duos. And that was substantially better than the likes of Morgan, for example, on Big Fat Donut there. So I don't know what a car maker has to do not to officially exist in Australia, but I would have thought that selling zero would be one of those things. Anyway, you can throw a quarter of the market away if you identify these two categories of irrelevance, but that still leaves you with kind of mid-30s, doesn't it? You know, And that's a big number. And some of these vehicles are in, in that category. Some of those vehicles are really popular and they're quite mainstream aspirational as well. And yet I'd suggest, by virtue of this single characteristic, that you should run, not walk, you should run away from these brands. And there's about 20 of them in this category, and I have to explain why I'm going to ditch them. So we're going to do that next. And incidentally, yes, bin cam is coming, regular viewers. So incidentally, I want to talk about why we're doing this, because this characteristic that you need to avoid, it occurs interpersonally, it occurs with all businesses, it occurs with regulators, and it occurs with governments. And it's essentially... At its core, it's the failure of integrity, right? Because you can go down a road as a consumer, you can go down a road as a voter, you can go down the road as somebody who has a relationship, like a professional relationship, a personal relationship, a family relationship with another person, and sooner or later you will get to an issue where there's a T-junction, it's not really a fork in the road, it's a T-junction. There's this way or that way. And one of these roads says, if you go this way, what's the right thing to do? And you do that, okay? And the other fork, like the other direction, goes to what can I get away with? And this is kind of what we're seeing in public life and in private life and in business relationships and in consumer, retail, whatever, commercial relationships. There's an increasing trend for people to go down this track of what can I get away with? It's a failure of integrity up front and it leads to massive problems. And there are at least 20 different car brands in the market today, in my view, which lack the fundamental integrity to warrant your consideration as a customer, potentially. And that's what I want to drill down into today. I do want to give you some examples, however, of this kind of conduct, because it's everywhere. It's a little bit like the Matrix, you know? You have to see it to believe it kind of thing. Like, every time former Prime Minister... Scott Morrison opened his trap, seemingly. He was a shining beacon of what can I get away with. He didn't approach, in my view, that job with any integrity whatsoever. And I think subsequently the electorates come to view that as being the case. You don't get to be the minister for everything covertly and survive. You know, you don't emerge with your integrity intact, at least not on my world. So there's that. Another great example in the political sphere is John Barillaro's failed escape to New York, which to me at least fails every known sniff test. And the interesting thing about that is that although hypothetically a whole set of arrangements was made that allowed him to quote-unquote get away with it, when the oxygen of publicity escaped into these arrangements, the whole thing just got terminated, right? And he didn't ultimately end up doing that, becoming the Trade Commissioner, etc. There's plenty of evidence of this available online. You can research it if you want. But I'd suggest that it's just an example of a failure of integrity in public life. And there's plenty of other examples as well on both sides of politics leading back many years now. In other words, it's not just a car problem, it's kind of a society problem. And in the automotive domain, there's some huge failures of integrity, such as with welfare cheat ARB, okay? ARB, I looked up the details this morning, they received $9.5 million, essentially from the taxpayer in JobKeeper and other subsidies, and yet 
they paid a $31.5 million dividend. And not the least of which was that 2.3 million of that 31 and a bit went to Andrew and Roger Brown, which is where the name comes from, ARB, Andrew, Roger Brown. Okay, so Andrew is the managing director and he's a good bloke. I've met him many times. I actually like him personally. I've never met Roger, but he's the chairman and they pocketed that dough and shareholders pocketed the rest of it and roughly a third of that dividend could be attributable to JobKeeper and other subsidies of that nature, which seems like a failure of integrity to me, more a case of what we can get away with than what is the right thing to do. I think if you've got a whole bunch of people together and in the pub or something and ask them what they thought about that, more of them would land on the side of that's not the right thing to do than would be in full support. And I guess some of the people in full support would be ARB shareholders who probably would have preferred that their dividend did not shrink by one third in that financial year. Another example in this vein in the automotive sphere is Eagers Automotive, which you might not have heard of, but they operate more than 200 dealerships in Australia, and they're publicly listed also. They received $130 million in JobKeeper from the taxpayer, and they made a $156 million profit. Extreme moral relativism, I'd suggest. So the the then chairman, who's a dude you've never heard of named Martin Ward, he's not the chairman anymore, he told the AFR that he thought the money had been used wisely. He didn't use the word wisely. I'm just paraphrasing the guts of what he told the AFR. And then he said that they would not be paying it back because they had, quote, an obligation to all of their stakeholders. And in my view, that's extreme corporate bastardry right there. It fails. Is there not a higher obligation, right, to right and wrong, fundamental right and wrong? That That's the question that I would ask Mr Ward, right? And he'd probably have a good response for that and we'd probably end up disagreeing on it, I'd suggest. But anyway, this is another example, in my view, of extreme corporate moral relativism. And you could be either agreeing with me furiously or disagreeing furiously. I don't care. But just by way of contrast, Toyota Australia, which I am critical of in so many ways, their anti-environment lobbying and the spooky, scary, divorced from reality statements they make in many other domains, such as their declared war on carbon, right? Toyota got a big fat wedge out of the taxpayer as well, right? They got 18 million bucks in JobKeeper subsidies. And then, like ARB and Eagers Automotive, their balance sheets inverted themselves and they start, started going from red to black and then they went pretty fucking black. And then, ultimately, Toyota paid it back. And Matthew Callagher, who's the cheese of Toyota Oz, said at that time, quote... We were very fortunate to weather the storm better than most, so our management and board decided that returning JobKeeper payments was the right thing to do, right thing to do, as a responsible corporate citizen. So I'd suggest that those three organisations, they can't all be right. One of them's right in terms of doing the right thing, what was the morally right way to go here. And I'd suggest that the car market is exactly the same. The different companies in the car market could not be more different on this point. Like, all car makers have websites and brochures and marketing campaigns all designed to promote the product. And to them, their product is shit hot, so much better than the competition, when in reality, the truth is... Kill something every day to maintain operational proficiency. It's just a, a pro tip, dude. Now, the thing that is really similar among all car companies is their vehicles. Like, if you buy a seven-seat SUV, it's almost the same as every other competing seven-seat SUV, and yet its praises will be sung so loud and so hard in the brochure, right? But a Sorento, a CX-9, a... There's another one. I can take the day off tomorrow. I don't have to kill anything tomorrow. CX-9 is almost the same as Sorrento, and Sorrento's a clone of Santa Fe, and Kluger's not that different, you know, like... 
The difference is the companies themselves and their approach to right and wrong when you are a customer. Because when you're a customer, you're locked in. The after-sales experience is markedly different to the sales experience. I mean, if you're not treated like a king at the sales experience, things are going to be really bad after sales, aren't they? Because once you are locked in, it's just different. Anyway, I'd also suggest that we've got rules about what consumers should do and what retailers and wholesalers should do, importers, whatever. The rules are very clear, but the environment itself is badly regulated for a few different reasons. And the first reason is that the laws themselves, specifically Australian consumer law, was written basically with the premise, the underlying premise was that everyone would act in good faith and try to do the right thing. And the law is more of a guideline about what to do if there's ever a disagreement. And litigation, right? Litigation is kind of a last resort that we, we probably don't need to get to in the vast majority of cases because both parties will see reason and a compromise will be reached and we'll be on the road to doing the right thing, okay? Nothing could be further from the truth because of the imbalance of power. If a car maker decides, what can I get away with? How are you going to fight them? Because they've got lawyers and resources and if they've got to drop a 100,000 bucks fighting you in... VCAT or NCAT or whatever, then consumer court, basically, then that's sort of chicken feed for a car company, whereas it's a big fat wedge for you, especially in an environment where cost of living pressures are rising and it's kind of significant right at the moment. So if you've got a problem with your car, it is a relief to have rolled the dice and landed with a car maker that is prepared to identify what is the right thing and just do it. So with that in mind, I'd also suggest that the ACCC is asleep at the wheel and that doesn't help because they're playing this game, this hail fellow well met game where they think that everyone is trying to do the right thing and nothing could be further from the truth in my estimation at the coalface here receiving complaints all the time from consumers who are being seemingly let down by car makers. So that's the overarching hypothesis, right? Let us therefore get to the meat and potatoes of this report, Mr. and just throw some players under the bus. And in the interest of brevity and doing this in an efficient way, I'm going to lump some brands together so that I don't repeat myself. Number one with a bullet here, I'm chunking them together because they've got the same parent. It's the Indian multinational manufacturing conglomerate called Tata, Jaguar and Land Rover. And the order I'm going to do these in is from low sales to high sales, okay? So we're just getting out of the blocks here. And although this is my opinion, it is informed by evidence, and I'm going to give you the evidence. And therefore, if you want to do more research because you're particularly in love with the idea of buying a Range Rover, you can go out and do your research and make a decision based on your own findings, which is probably a really rational way to approach this. If you want to do that, Google the following term, which would be Sally Morphy. Range Rover, Morphy, M-O-R-P-H-Y. Sally Morphy's a affluent woman who bought a Range Rover for about a quarter of a million dollars, more or less, okay? It was an autobiography, so pretty special. Very nice car. I've driven a heap of Land Rovers and a heap of Range Rovers, and I've loved every Range Rover I've ever driven, but I would never buy one because of this, because of this kind of conduct, of which this is just one example, but it is a shining example, okay? Ms. Morphy paid a quarter of a million bucks for this car, and shortly after the fairy tale began, it ended because the car went poopy in its trousers, the dealer couldn't fix it, she got the runaround, they ended up in VCAT, okay? And VCAT ordered a full refund, and Land Rover were complete bar stewards in respect of their conduct orbiting this whole thing, okay? So not only did they have to pay back the Range Rover for roughly a quarter of a million, but they also had to award, they also had to pay Ms. Morphy's costs, which were roughly 140,000 bucks. 
That's a roll of the dice that many of us could not afford, but it's kind of interesting. They also had to pay roughly 150000 bucks to the dealer, who was the first respondent in this lawsuit, because they just operated in a completely unreasonable way. They willfully tried to delay proceedings and amp up the plaintiff's costs and all of this sort of stuff that you are really not supposed to do if you are the defendant in a case of this nature. It was so bad, the court calls it relevant delinquency, okay? So... It was so bad that they awarded costs against Land Rover Australia. And the sum total of all of this, like the quarter of a million bucks plus the 140 for the plaintiff's costs and the 150 for the dealer's costs, because the dealer tried to do the right thing, and the roughly equivalent amount, 140 or 150, whatever it was, that Land Rover paid for its own legal representation meant that this $250,000 Range Rover and dealing with it ended up costing Land Rover about 670000 bucks. And to me, this is like a gee whiz in its own right, but it's also iconic because it, it's an example of how absolutely bolted on some organisations are to the option of what can we get away with? Because if they'd just done what's the right thing to do up front, they'd be, what, $450,000 further in the black, better off, whatever, okay? So that's why I suggest that you don't do business with Land Rover or Jaguar because this is just one example of their conduct when a defective product cannot be fixed and there's a lot of money on the table. It's not malicious. It's not like they're intentionally evil. And this is another salient feature of most of the interactions with companies that perform badly and their clients, such as you potentially, they're not trying to be Dr. Evil. They're just trying to see what they can get away with. Like, dude, it's not personal. Feels pretty fucking personal to you, though, I'd suggest. Anyway, number two here is a whole bunch of brands under the one umbrella, and that umbrella would be Fiat Chrysler Australia, okay? This would include Jeep, which had about 6,700 sales last year, but also brands that are kind of nowhere, like Alfa Romeo, Chrysler, uh, there's Fiat as well, which sold about 1,100 cars, if you include 800 vans. And the reason I'm suggesting that they're well worth avoiding is the great many complaints I've had over the years specifically about Jeeps and the inability of that company to do what's reasonable. And this is exemplified by one that you can look up. Just look up Lawrence Family, L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E, Lawrence Family Grand Cherokee. That should do it. Now, the Lawrence Family is sort of made for tabloid TV, made for tabloid reporting generally because they're a really wholesome, attractive-looking young family. They owned a Grand Cherokee. It went poopy in its trousers and Jeep could have done the right thing, but instead they wanted to hit them with a bill for 50-something thousand bucks to repair the car. Ultimately, they turned that around, but not until, not unlike the Escape to New York Barilaro example I gave earlier, the whole story blipped on national news headlines everywhere, okay? And they did this, in my view, principally as a means of damage control because things were looking bad and the only way to make them look slightly less bad was to say, oh, we made a mistake, we're fixing it now, we're going to pay for these repairs, which, let's not forget, costs them substantially less than $50,000 to do because they get the parts at a bit of a discount and they get the repairs done for a bit of a discount too. So there's that. The repair that they paid for did not cost them 50 and in my view, it was done for damage control. So if you do business with a Jeep or a Land Rover, you should at least know what you're getting into. And then if you say, but I love that Grand Cherokee, or I love that Range Rover, I've always wanted a Discovery, whatever, at least do it with part of your rational brain engaged, is kind of what I'm saying there. If there is some horrible intra poopy moment with your new car, it is likely that the what we can get away with option will be the one that they invoke when what you're expecting as a customer is, hey, dude, just do the right thing, okay? 
Volvo is another one to throw under the bus. They had about 11,000 sales last year. They're terrible at customer support. This is essentially because they were joined at the hip to Jaguar, Land Rover, Aston Martin and Ford. Ford owned all of those brands as part of the, quote, premier automotive group. The global financial crisis need Ford in the nuts and they had to have a fire sale to get rid of it. So Jaguar and Land Rover went to the Indians. A team of Middle Eastern investors, like a consortium, picked up Aston Martin and then Volvo went to the Chinese. So in Australia, though, the head office for Jaguar and Land Rover is in the same place as the head office for Volvo still and many of the dealers are still the same and it's still pretty much business as usual and they have the the blinkers on when it comes to what's the right thing to do still. So there's plenty of examples for that. Number four that I would throw away now is all the brands under the umbrella of Atico, right? Now, you've probably never heard of Atico, but Atico is a private importer of fledgling and other dud brands. The brands in Australia currently under the rubric of Atico is, uh, they include LDV, Ram, Renault, and Maserati. Probably not too many aspiring Maserati owners watching this, not no serious buyers anyway, I'd suggest. But LDV, LDV has become quite popular. Just over 16,000 sales last year. Ram's quite popular as well, given what it is, 6,000 and change worth of sales last year. And Renault for about 9,000 sales last year. Now, a Tico does not have a very strong commitment to right and wrong in the after-sales support domain, in my estimation. They're more a what-can-we-get-away-with kind of deal. And the example that I would serve up to you there is something you can Google easily. It's an example out of Queensland. It's Timothy Rigby LDV T60. There's an official court judgment that you can read there, and it reads like the script to a frigging comedy. Okay, It just does. Mr Rigby is an employee at a surf club on the Gold Coast in Queensland. So he parks at the surf club, which is, unsurprisingly, right there next to the beach. Like, knock me down with a feather. And he bought the freaking car from a dealership located, from memory, between a saltwater canal and the beach. And problematically for Mr Rigby, he noticed that his brand new shiny LDV T60 was starting to rust and it was getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And he kept engaging with them about it and they kept going, nah. And the quote to repair this vehicle, to repair it, right, was almost 50 grand. And they said, oh, well, the reason it's rusting is because you're using it near the beach, most of the Australian population, of course, lives around the edges and we are surrounded by the ocean, so there's that. The dealership was near the beach and one thing led to another. Anyway, the court saw reason there. The uh, judge in this particular case decided that the LDV T60 was, quote, made of poor quality material. I'm doing that from memory, but the words poor quality were used unless I've had a brain aneurysm in the meantime. I'm faithfully reporting the tone of that judgment to you, if not the actual words. And it could all have been swept under the rug if only let's do the right thing was the preferred option instead of let's just try and brush this guy and see what we can get away with. Okay, so next we should look at Nissan, which is a big seller in Australia. Not as big as they were. They're only a shadow of their former self. In fact nearer to the brink of collapse than they would admit, but 26,500 sales, like, it's not bad. Just look what they did to first-generation Nissan LEAF owners, okay? The battery in that first-generation LEAF was very badly designed in that its cooling mechanism was wholly passive, and that means that when the battery is generating a lot of heat, such as when it is being discharged heavily or when it is being charged, its only means of losing heat, of bleeding heat off into the environment, is convection into the air around it. It doesn't have a cooling system, like an active cooling system. There's no fans, no radiator, no fluid flow, none of that stuff. 
And what this means is that the batteries started to lose their ability to hold a charge. Range fell off a cliff for many owners. In some cases, the range per charge dropped down to about 20 kilometres, especially in winter, places like Canberra. And what Nissan did, instead of saying, oh, that, sorry, bad us, we've redone that design and we're going to replace the battery packs, instead... What they did was they invoked this bullshit battery replacement program in which they stung the owners of these vehicles $10,000. I think it was actually $9,950 if memory serves. And they said, that, oh, the cost of the replacement is thirty five grand, so we're subsidising you by $25,000. Aren't we freaking champions kind of thing? And... In fact, it was just a stitch up for 10 grand because consumer law says vehicles should be reasonably durable. They should meet the durability expectations of reasonable customers. Certainly it is reasonable, I'd suggest, to expect a 10-year-old car to have more than 20 k's worth of range. If that happened in your internal combustion car, you would be livid. And let's not forget the first generation of Hyundai Kona Electric had a bit of a problem with its battery too, didn't it? And what Hyundai did instead, they didn't say, oh, battery replacement program, just 10 grand and we'll make it all go away. They just took the cars back and replaced the batteries and they recycled them ethically here on shore in Australia. So there's a marked difference between those two approaches and I'd suggest... Nissan is really a brand better avoided, in particular because there's really nothing that you can buy from Nissan that you can't buy somewhere else in an equivalent segment that's kind of better anyway. Moving on now, we'll talk about Mercedes-Benz, good old three-prong, right? Three-prong prides itself in its marketing, at least, as its engineering excellence and its refinement and finesse, and they just do the job better than anyone else if you ask them. In fact, you just have to scratch the surface and you realise how shoddy a lot of their workmanship really is. An example of this is their command online system architecture. They sold a bunch of cars not all that long ago with command online, which was spruiked as this wonderful connectivity technology, when in fact what it was doing was operating on an antiquated Windows XP architecture and the security certificates expired and they were no longer supported by Microsoft and 3 Prong just decided one day to turn the whole friggin' thing off. It was just one day owners woke up and it was no longer available. So there's that. And then if you really arced up about it, they kind of said, well, oh, we'll compensate you. Here's 500 bucks. I saw a letter to that effect and I think there was a confidentiality agreement like a gag order a non-disclosure agreement that went along with the 500 bucks and if someone told me to shut up for 500 bucks I'd kind of tell them where to shove it which was what one of the owners did with me essentially which is how I know about this anywho there's that okay they just turned it off one day and that seems like a suboptimal solution to me. And if you need more evidence than that, talk to anybody here in Right Hand Drivesville who owns an all-wheel drive Mercedes, which is cursed with the crabbing problem. Now, the crabbing problem is really when you wind on a bit of steering lock, like a fair bit of steering lock, and the transmission front to rear starts to wind up or bind, and the car starts to crab its way around the corner or chew up your tiles in your expensive garage or something of that nature. Now, Mercedes' solution to that, the three-prong official response to that is, that's not a defect, it's an operational characteristic. I suggest... Oh, missed it again. I don't know what's wrong with me today. Maybe I'm losing my touch. Anyway, I'd suggest that that's not exactly down the path to what's the right thing to do and let's do that, is it? It's like, what can we get away with here? That's how they roll. Next, and unsurprisingly, anything clubbed with the Volkswagen stick, which would, we, which would be the brand Volkswagen itself, 
which still manages to sell about 31,000 vehicles a year here in Australia. That's what they sold, just slightly shy of that in 2022. But also Audi, with sales off a cliff at about 15,000. Skoda, which is Volkswagen for people who should have gone to Specsavers, as well as Porsche and Cupra, which is an interesting experiment, if you ask me. Volkswagen, more than any other brand, has very high sales as you aggregate all the different Volkswagen brands, but it's the ultimate what-can-we-get-away-with car company. And the evidence for that is that it's the only car company that I can see, anyway, operating in Australia, which has achieved full felony criminality status in the United States. Like, conspiracy is what they admitted to. They paid, I think it was $4.3 billion after pleading guilty to criminal, like felony conspiracy in the United States. And if that doesn't set off a few red flags, if they're prepared to do that as a global conglomerate, fish rots from their head, right? What are they prepared to do if you're nice looking, drives fairly well, Volkswagen or derivative, and they do, they look good and they drive really well and people who are happy with them are really, really happy with them. But if you have a problem and it's intractable, they can't really solve it, it's not going to be so much a matter of let's do the right thing as what can we get away with because that's just how they roll. And they've been doing it for donkey's years now and I don't see any evidence of any change. So you want to still buy one? That's on you, dude. Next, Isuzu Ute, which has outrageously high sales when you consider that they really only sell Duos products, the MUX and the even more popular D-Max, okay? But they are just terrible at customer support. And most recently, and I reported on this at the time, there was a dude named Daryl Imray, and he's a D-Max owner, and his car had like 120,000 Ks on it, I think, and it was a year out of warranty, okay? And some significant part went poopy in its trousers and the, the bill to repair it was going to be multi-thousands of dollars and he asked them to look after him and they denied his request on the basis of his vehicle being out of warranty. And very clearly, now you can't be a car maker and not know this, okay? Very clearly on the issue of warranty, you still have consumer law rights after your warranty expires. If your vehicle does not meet the durability expectations of a reasonable consumer, that is a violation of the acceptable quality consumer guarantee, which is a piece of legislation designed to protect you. Isuzu knows this, every car maker knows this, they often try and brush you on the basis of, oh, it's out of warranty, even though it seemed pretty clear to me that Mr Imre had a solid case for repair under consumer law, okay? They just went, nah, your vehicle was out of warranty, it's been out of warranty for about a year, that's going to be X number of thousand dollars. If you want to be in Mr. Imray's position, like step right up, dude. But Isuzu Ute Australia is just one of those companies that prefers to go down the path of what can we get away with, seemingly, as opposed to what is the right thing to do in these totality of circumstances. Ultimately, of course, this is a decision for you. Now, we're almost there. I only have one brand to go, and I suppose you can guess what it is. That brand would be Ford. Ford has a terrible consumer law compliance reputation, frankly. The new Ranger is pretty clearly a dog also. And my heart was as heavy as a butterfly strewn field in in spring last week or the week before, whatever it was, when a current affair, that bastion of responsible journalism, covered the plight of... Who were they? Bianca Fitzsimons and a dude from Victoria, Alex Tomlinson. Okay, 
these are two customers who've been properly thrown under the bus. Like, their Ranger just dies and it can't be fixed and it's in the dealership for, like, weeks upon weeks endlessly. And these are really significant purchases for both of these customers. They're over the moon when they acquire the vehicle. They got the new Ranger! And then it just shits itself and Ford can't fix it. And this is unacceptable off the bat because one of the requirements about selling anything in this country is that you have to be able to fix it if it fails or replace it. And incidentally, Ford can't do either of those things right now. So why is the ACCC full on asleep on that one? Got to ask yourself, right? Now, Current Affair says that it has received, quote, dozens of similar complaints from people in the position of Ms. Tomlinson and um, no, Ms. Fitzsimons and Mr. Tomlinson, right? And it just beggars belief because Ford is a big operation. Even in Australia, they're big. They're selling nearly 67,000 vehicles last year. They've got resources. They just clearly haven't got the capacity to support the product. And the interesting thing to me is that these people have taken a large step. It's a pretty big step. It's a pretty big step, okay, to approach a current affair. And I speak on this with some authority because I've been on a current affair like at least a hundred times back when, you know, Mike Moore was the host and afterwards when Tracy was the host as well. And I used to be their motoring guy, so I kind of know how that works and I understand the mindset of people who approach a current affair on this kind of issue, and they are at their freaking wit's end. It's like the last thing you do before you fix bayonets. Anywho, Ford is like mucking them around for weeks, months, whatever. They're stalled on the grid. Ford is spectacularly unresponsive because they don't care, okay? And then it blows up in the media domain and they replace the cars, or they at least commit to replacing the cars. See, um, Ford issued what in my view is a kind of bullshit statement where they apologised for the delay and I didn't see any evidence of them just drowning in contrition or anything, but they apologised for the delay and they admitted that they'd mucked these people around and they said that um, one of the cars had been replaced and the other one was due to be replaced in February. But I'd suggest that there are dozens of people seemingly in this position and I see no evidence that they're not still going under the bus in rather a large way. So those would be the brands that I would avoid if I was you because there's plenty of evidence in the public domain that these brands just lack the fundamental ability to identify what is the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to do and go with the right one and instead their God is just they, they, their God is money. They worship money and they go, which course of action is going to get us the most money at the end of the day? Can we get away with that? And it's not malicious. They're not Dr. Evil. They're not trying to jam the pineapple into you willfully. It's just that, hey, if you've got to go under the bus so that they can make more money, then it's under the bus o'clock in the customer service department, isn't it? And I'd suggest that it's really just indifference, Right? It's just like indifference to your plight, even though you've dumped, in the case of a Ranger, $70,000 on the product. And to a consumer, it's, it's just like dealing with a sociopath because that's exactly how sociopaths behave. And I'd suggest that all of these companies that I've just mentioned, if they were people and you got a psychologist involved, many of them would be diagnosed with psychopathy, you know? this, Or at least sociopathy, one of the two. It's... It's just a complete lack of empathy that leads them down this path. And also they're bean counter driven. They want to report back to head office and say, here's the total financial position that we're in now. Aren't we good blokes? And if part of that was just throwing customers under the bus, well, hey, we've already extracted the dough from them. So I'd suggest we can ditch a few more cars from a few more brands from your short list and I will then go through the last men standing, if you like. I ditch BYD. I really would because although the Atto 3 is electric and it's shiny and new and therefore virtuous, BYD still is a mad science experiment. And the experiment is 
Is buying a BYD a good idea? They're currently fielding for lab rats. You don't have to be one. If you want to be a lab rat in the mad BYD good idea, bad idea experiment, there's nothing to stop you. But I'd suggest the prudent position to be in is just to watch some other lab rats run the experiment. And then if in three years or something, it looks like two thumbs up, BYD, great idea, jump in then, okay? Honda. Honda's on the brink of commercial collapse, and it used to be something, it used to be the BMW of the East, it's a shadow of its former self, the prices are extortionate and outrageous currently because of their new business model, and for all these reasons, just steer clear, dude. Peugeot and Citroën, just, they don't have critical mass. They're imported by the same company that imports Subaru, and they are ridiculously good at customer support, Inchcape. They're called Inchcape. However, because of the lack of critical mass, there's a few issues around dealership size, or the number of dealerships around the country is low, okay? So there's that. If you have a Tanty with your local dealership, it's going to be a long way to the next Citroen dealership. So there's that to consider. Local parts inventory is likely to be quite low. Dealership training, the investment there likely to be quite low as well. So for all these reasons, Peugeot and Citroen, unless you're a real Francophile, I'd be steering clear. Polestar, it's a joke, basically. It's like a Volvo spin-off, and Volvo's going all electric anyway, and look at us, we're investing in hovercrafts and hydrofoils, and we've just owned a customer experience setter in Chatty, a short stroll from KFC. Sanyong, okay? Sanyong. Sanyong sales are actually not too bad at the moment, but... Sanyong's had five cracks at Australia, and how many cracks do we have to have with failures at the end until we decide that that's a bit of an Einsteinian example of running the same experiment over and over and expecting a different result? So, anyway. And Suzuki, right? I wouldn't be bothered with Suzuki because Suzuki's sales are kind of nowhere in the context of Japanese car makers, and objectively, there are better Japanese products from better Japanese manufacturers. So, dude, just buy one of them. And now, the moment I've all been waiting for, and doubtless you have as well, I always get comments like, when he does this, when he assassinates all these brands, there's nothing left. I'd suggest that there is something left, dude. We've got almost a quarter of the market is still here, and these are the good options, okay? BMW, more or less alphabetical order. BMW, if you're in the market for a premium German car, BMW is the best choice. They're the best of those three at customer support. They just are. Every time I have referred a legitimate customer complaint to BMW head office, even if someone's been stiffed royally by a dealer, when the problem gets elevated to head office level, someone steps in and a big frown goes upside down. That's my experience anyway. Genesis next. Like, Genesis is nowhere commercially, but the product is quite attractive and it's nice to drive as well. And it's different in many ways to the premium German thing. The reason I'm putting Genesis on the list is basically because it's underpinned by Hyundai and the Hyundai Motor Group's got the readies to support Genesis, even though it's not commercially viable in its own right here in Australia. And the Hyundai Motor Group generally, it's certainly here in Australia, they do kind of look after their customers. Yes, still got it. Number three, Hyundai. I've just spruiked them enough. They're pretty good with their customers. They're certainly up there, top three, I'd suggest. Kia, Ditto. Hyundai and Kia are flip sides of the same proposition, if you haven't been made aware of that already. And their commitment to customer uh, service, they're well down the track of what's the right thing to do in most ways, I'd suggest. Lexus is another one that I would suggest. We're up to number five. That would be Lexus. Lexus is just different than the premium German thing. In many ways, they're better because more reliable, underpinned by Toyota, which has infinite readies to 
prop Lexus up with, even though their sales are really not that high. They're not as aspirational as the Germans. Like, let's be frank, but they're more reliable and you really do get premium service if you buy a Lexus. So Mazda, I'd suggest that Mazda has had its run-ins with the ACCC, but Mazda is certainly way above the median when it comes to are we going to do the right thing. They're probably not as good as Subaru, Hyundai, Kia, Lexus, like that, but they're not far behind. So they're also the number two car company in the nation, so they've got critical mass beyond critical mass, and they're definitely worthy of consideration because from an engineering point of view, Mazda has kind of become what Honda sort of was in the 90s. MG is worthy of consideration too, in my view, because MG has emerged very rapidly to be a player in the top 10. You see them getting sort of front row billing at multi-franchise dealerships. They're right out there in pole position on the street frontage. They're not sold out the back anymore. They've got sales volume, which means they've got investment from dealers, which means they've got dealership technical training and onshore parts inventory and things of that nature in line with their spectacular rise in sales. Mini is another one to consider if you want something European and a bit exotic because Mini's really just BMW, okay? And everything I said about BMW really pertains to Mini. My one reservation about Mini is that for many people who saw both Italian job movies and they, I'd love one of them, I think the novelty wears off before you make the last lease repayment in many cases. Like, they are a really novel purchase. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with them. But for many people, I think the polish wears off before uh, before they're out of it, basically. So there's that to consider. Mitsubishi is on the list also. Mitsubishi is certainly a top 10 car maker. I've been extremely happy with mine. I see a lot of evidence of Mitsubishi doing the right thing by customers when they could elect to play the what can we get away with card. They don't seem to do that as often. So they're certainly on the list. And hey, I bought one, so there's that. Uh, Subaru. Subaru is absolutely up there in terms of its customer support. I am concerned that Subaru's soul is being incrementally sucked out by Toyota's bean counters because Subaru is essentially part of the Toyota group now and this will not end well for Subaru from a product point of view, but from a support point of view if you are a customer. In situations where they actually go beyond right or wrong, and by that, what I mean is they give you the benefit of the doubt. When they could say, you know what, we think that's on you, quite often Subaru comes down on the side of, you know what, we think that's on you, but we're going to look after you anyway because we value your business. And that's why I put them at the absolute top of the customer service game in Australia. And then there's Toyota, right? Toyota is good at support, plus, in general, like they do have these... They have these incredible um, moments where they fall flat on their face, as they did with whatever it was, a quarter of a million customers or something, who bought the 2.8 diesel, which had a design defect with its uh, diesel particulate filter, and they just pretended that was not the case for years until they fixed it. And then, hey, problem solved. Why are we still talking about this? But in general, with one-offs, if you've got a one-off problem, they're on it, and they're pretty good. And not only that, there's a service centre everywhere because they're the biggest car maker on sale in Australia at the moment. So there you go. That would be the 11 remaining brands that I suggest if you are a mainstream car maker that you... I hate that right at the end. If you've got the bucks, they're ready to go. There's plenty of choice even among the brands that I reckon, if you have a problem down the track, will be more likely to pass your problem through the filtration of what is the right thing to do. Let's do that. And hey, if you still want that Jeep or that Land Rover, free country dude, but that's on you. <laughs>